What is the power of Christ and how do we access it? Three different words in the New Testament Greek manuscripts usually get a singular English word as their translation. What are these words and what are the differences between them? We see the phrase heavenly places often in the New Testament. What does that mean for us today? Jesus has all authority, but are there different levels of authority for us? And how can we know what they are and how to use them? Is the doctrine of Christ tied to the power of Christ? I want to know. It is our great honor to welcome each and every one of you to this week's episode of The Doctrine of Christ with myself and Brother Jimmy Cooper, because whether you know it or not, the doctrine of Christ is the most important thing in your life. And I'm just thankful once again to be able to share the doctrine of Christ with everyone, Jimmy. Hey, Amen, brother. You look sharp tonight. Well, thank you. I like well, the tie. Well, I'm a styling. <laughs> Our DLC for this evening is entitled, The Power of Christ, The Power of Christ. And we're going to begin in Matthew, the 10th chapter, and we're going to read the first verse. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sicknesses and all manner of disease. Now, that word power is the one we're going to focus on, and that word in the Greek is exousia. It's number 1849, and Thayer's lexicon says that it's the power of choice, the liberty of doing as one pleases. And the word exousia is very close to being synonymous with free will. And the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, it says, unlike expressions for indwelling, objective, physical, or spiritual power, exousia denotes the power which decides. Now, we're going to see that the decisions we make will put us under one or two power sources. Everyone has a power source. And we're going to be studying three Greek words for power. One word is kratos, and that means the power that is in Christ. The power in Christ is called kratos. The power that is given to us through the Holy Spirit is called dunamis. It's the delegated power, and exousia is the power to choose. And exousia and the decisions we make determine what power source we have, the extent of the power, and many, many things that are so important uh, as we go on to look at this. Now, obviously, this is of supreme importance. Now, in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, this is the spiritual warfare chapter. And in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, we read this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, that word power there is 2904. It's kratos. That's the power of his might. And we are told to be strong in the power of his might. So we have to make decisions with the power that we have to be able to be under the power of his might. This is the power that resides in him. And in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 19, the text says this, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power? Once again, that's Kratos, 
that's his power, Kratos, to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Christ has mighty power. We've talked about in the DLC about omnipotence. He is all powerful and his power wants to work for us. And we have to make decisions that will enable us to be strong in the power of his might. Now, in Second Thessalonians, let's look at Second Thessalonians chapter one and verse eight. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there's that word obey. And to be under the distribution of the mighty power of Christ, it takes obedience. This is something we talk a lot about here on the DOC. We have to conform ourselves to the doctrine of Christ, the commandments of God, and do the best that we can to keep ourselves in a right relationship with him. It takes obedience. And as we walk in obedience, we can expect to be uh given access to the benefit of his mighty power. And in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, we have the text that gives us our other Greek word for power, which is dunamis. That's where we get our word dynamite. You know, there's dynamite power. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but ye shall receive power. That is dunamis. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So dunamis is what the Holy Ghost gives to us. Kratos is the mighty power of his strength. Exousia is what we choose to do and what connects us with the power source of dunamis, or the Kratos of Christ, or we're going to see that there are other power sources that we can tap into. Most people are running on the wrong power source. And here again, in Acts chapter 5 and verse 32, the scripture says here, and we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom the Lord hath given to them that obey him. There's that word again. And why does the Lord give the Holy Ghost to them that obey him? Because if you don't obey him, you don't need the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost is that dynamite power for us to fulfill the great commission of Christ here on the earth. Now, exousia is that which gives us the ability to choose. We all have free will. And I want to read here from the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, and I'm going to read here from volume two and page 565, and it will help us understand uh, this word exousia a little better. It says, the power it is used of the power which Satan exercises and imparts. And we're going to give a scripture for that, of course, in just a moment. Exousia is used for the power of Satan. It also says, and especially the power of freedom, which is given to Jesus and by him to his disciples. When we have new birth in Christ, and when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, It's like getting uh, an AR-15, only better. We then have power that we can choose to use. And it's all a matter of choosing and walking in obedience and plugging into the power source. And in Acts chapter 26, verse 18, the word exousia is used specifically of the power of Satan to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God. There's our word exousia. He wants to turn us from the exousia of Satan. He wants to stop us from being energized by Satan's power source, by being translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Let me read the whole text since I got excited and 
start talking, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. And let's look at from the Christ Satan perspective. When Jesus has one of his children that's walking in obedience to the gospel, he can choose and does to use his power on our behalf. Satan also has exousia. He also has fallen emissaries, and he can choose to do things against and to people, and a lot of times even for them to prosper them. A lot of times the worst thing that can happen to an individual is prosperity in a job they should not have, in a relationship they should never entered into. Wealth ruins more people than poverty, and that is just a fact. So it's very important to understand that we have free will and that we have the ability to put ourselves under, and everyone is under one power source or the other. And very few people that name the name of Christ are walking in obedience to the gospel and walking in obedience to the, the commands of God. I mean, that's just a fact. It's not something that I think it's something that's really pretty patently obvious. So that just tells us that we are living in what we have today. We have a demonized society. Our entire society is demonized from the top to the bottom, and people are being energized by Satan. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, book of Revelation that the dragon gave his power and authority unto the beast. And just like the beast is going to be directly energized by Satan, we have a we have an entire society that's being energized by Satan, tapping into his exousia, and he is glad to put the pedal down and keep firing the juice into him. Now in Colossians chapter one and verse three, thirteen, excuse me. 1 and 13. And notice how Paul speaks of the salvation experience. He speaks of it as being taken from under one power source unto another, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Everyone that does is not born again. They are under the power of darkness. It says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2, wherein in times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the chill, the spirit that now worketh in the children of obedience. And that's what salvation is. It's deliverance from the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. We now have access to a different power source, and we have to understand that we can't fuel the train ourselves. that we have to have the power of the Holy Spirit, the dunamis, and we have to stand under the mighty power of Christ. When, uh, if I'm, uh, we all have bosses in some realm, uh, and our boss or the governor, or the mayor, you could use a lot of examples, they can make decisions. And that's what it is. Exousia is free will to make decisions. They have power over us to decide this or to decide that. And when we come into the realm of Christ, we receive dunamis, and we have exousia to make decisions to affect the kingdom of God and to affect other people. And that's what, uh, and that's what power is. And that's how it works. On down in verse 16 in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And There are angels, good and bad, that have authority. That's what the word powers there means. It is exousia. And literally, this is a word that's used 
of angels because they have the ability, uh, a good angel, we'll see here in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Angels are ministers for us. There are angels that have the ability and the right to decide to do things on our behalf. That's their power. There are good angels that if we're walking in obedience to build the kingdom, they will make decisions to help us. And that's a great thing. On the other side of the coin, there are powers that are fallen. We read about the fallen powers in Ephesians 6. If a person is plugged in and energized by Satan, there are fallen powers that have the power to make decisions to do things against you. It's on both sides. And you're 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 getting into one power source or the other. And you're opening and you know, you really talk about the opening doors. Well, boy, this is really uh what it is. You're opening your the door to be totally uh put yourself at the arbitrary decision of entities in the fallen realm. Now, we're going to look at a phrase that's re- used repeatedly in the book of Ephesians. It's used uh, five times. And we're going to look at the five places where it's used, and it's going to help us to understand uh, authority. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now, that phrase there that we're looking at is in heavenly places in Christ. That's where we have been blessed. We have been blessed at the right hand of God. And we're going to see that this is very uh, specifically identified. And we see that phrase again. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There's that same Greek word right there. It was translated in Ephesians 1, 3 in heavenly places. So this tells us where we wrestle. We wrestle at the throne of God, just like in the book of Job. When Job was being tried, there was a day when Satan came and made accusation against him. But we have a seat at the table. Job, he said, oh, I wish that there was a daysman that might intercede between me and you. But even then, Job knew that he had the ability to lay his case out before the Lord. And now, the way that we fight in with these fallen powers, we just go over their head. We are strong in the Lord in his mighty power. Now, I want to read a definition of this word that will help us understand a little more. This is from the uh, Danker's Lexicon, and it says here that this word is used, the word exousia is also used, that we said, of transcendent rulers and functionaries, powers of the spirit world. And the only way that we can deal with these powers of the spirit world is, like I said, we go over their head because all power is given unto Christ, Matthew 18, 18. That means that he is the supreme ruler of all. He can make decisions. The mayor can make decisions for our town. Jesus can make decisions for everything and everybody. All power is given unto him. Nobody is over his head. He is over all of these powers. And indeed, they are powers. The dark powers and the good angels can do a lot either for or against us. But Christ is over them all. He has all power. And In Ephesians chapter 1, let's look at verse 20 and 21. Oh, excuse me. Let's read verse 19. We got to get verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power 
to usward who believe according to the workings of his mighty power. Now, we read that verse earlier. That's the word kratos, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. So what we see here is that the way to access the kratos, the mighty power of Christ, is right there at the right hand of God. That's where he is. He's at the right hand of the Father. He is there as our great high priest and intercessor. We have a right to pour out our our heart before the Father. We can pour out our case to Christ, and we can just plead for mercy and justice at the throne. And if he will just decide to speak the word, the battle's over. And and that's, that's where it's at. And down here in the first heaven, we bash them and smash them. You know, there are devils down here in the first text we read in Matthew 10 and 1. We have authority over unclean spirits. We have authority over devils here in the first heaven. When we enter into battle in the second heaven and in the third, it's a little bit different because we're dealing with powers. We're dealing with entities that have either for the good or the bad ability to make decisions that affect our life. Now, in the book of Jude, chapter 1 and verse 9, and thank the Lord that he doesn't always judge us. Uh, He'll honor our zeal over our intelligence a lot of times. But there was actually a spiritual warfare conference where they rented an airplane And they actually went up in the airplane so they could rebuke the spiritual powers from their airplane. You know, um, what can you say? But in Jude, the ninth verse, it says, yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring railing, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuked thee. And that's how we deal with these powers. We go boldly before the throne. We pour out our heart to the Lord. And we ask him to speak the word, to rebuke these dark powers. And he will do it. Hmm. He will do it. And we have to be careful. You can get hurt. (laughs) You can get hurt when you're brash and arrogant in dealing with entities in the spiritual realm because they're a lot stronger than we are and they can make decisions when we put themselves when we put ourselves under their realm of power and when people are doing things that give these authorities rights to dis- make decisions in certain areas you're in a lot of trouble you've you've got to go to the throne and you've got to ask the lord to use his mighty power, his kratos, to override these powers. So even though we have Christ in us, and we've been given that authority like he did the disciples, or was that just for the disciples then? No. Then then (laughs) it, it does make me wonder why we can't deal with it directly. There are different levels of authority and power in the dark realm. Now, in the first heaven, here in this realm in which we live, the spirits in the first heaven, we have authority over. Okay, I see what you're saying. And that's why I say in the first heaven, we smash them and we bash them. We have authority. We cast them out. Uh, But when you're talking about principalities and powers, fallen angels in the second realm, and the seraphim that will accuse us uh, before the Father, it's different. We have, and this is one thing that uh, if you don't understand the comprehensive areas of spiritual warfare, there are things that are in the first heaven, there are things in the second, in the third, and there are also things in the underworld. Well, so it's more than just there is a devil that's cast it out. I imagine that there's some some listeners that might be wondering what some examples might be of first heaven things that we might have authority over or what might be second heaven things and what might be third heaven things. Can you give us a couple of examples? 
Yeah. Um, and in Scripture, there are three heavens. The first heaven is where we live, the atmosphere that is over this good old flat earth. And the Bible tells us in Enoch chapter 6 that and 15 about when the sons of God came down and cohabitated with the daughters of men, just like Genesis 6, that when these Nephilim die, they they do not rise, but they continue on the earth as disembodied spirits. This is what the devils that we read about in the in the Bible, in the New Testament, that Jesus cast out, he give us authority over devils and unclean spirits. Now, what I believe unclean spirits are, we know that there was also the corruption of the human genome. And there's a lot of people, I tell you, they're just acting like animals. I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't know the way to say it. They act like just brute beasts, which is another biblical term. And I believe the difference between an unclean spirit and a devil, I believe that the devil is a disembodied spirit of a creature created from the union of a Nephilim and a human woman, and that that unclean spirit is from the manipulation of the animal genome, which is just rampant today also. You know, the days of Noah are still with us. And I believe like a satire, uh, that is just one. The Bible speaks of satires. And when they die, I believe they become an unclean spirit. And there were many, many of these beings. They're all over the Bible. And today, this is you know, kind of reduced to fairy tales, but is that anything but? And the power of the demonic realm is rampant here in the first heaven. We have a demonically energized society and a nation. We're a devilish nation. And we have authority over down here in the first heaven. We got it. Well, that makes me, that makes it seem a little more clear why God would, would tell the children of Israel to kill everything in, in these certain countries including animals, because maybe they were all jacked up. They weren't like true, clean animals anymore. Yeah, no, they weren't many times. And uh, we could give many examples from Scripture and every ancient civilization. uh, You could talk about Babylon, Assyria, Greece, Rome, every one of them in the architecture. You have the, the chimeras. The, the half human, half animal creatures. And, you know, these were real entities that roamed the earth. The Pegasus, it's just all over mythology. But what we call mythology, they call theology. <laughs> and it was, it was real to them because it was. They really were. Of course, it's the demonic narrative, and right. there's a lot of embellishment attached to it, but these were real fallen entities. And um, the departed spirits, it says in the book of Isaiah, that the dead do not rise. The Nephilim will not rise in the resurrection. They continue as departed spirits. Hmm. And that's what we're dealing with. And, uh, you know, it just makes so much sense when, I mean, people are just absolutely the things that are being done, we could just go on for hours. They're just animals. They're just uh, mad dogs. The things that they're doing is it's just horrific. And it's just an absolute uh, demonic infestation is, is what we're dealing with. It's nothing less than that. And we have authority over those types of things. Yes. The disembodied spirits. Now, when that spirit's in a human, we also do. We can bind, but that's even a more dicey situation because you get someone uh, jacked up on meth or even worse, uh, filled with the devil coming at you. You better be ready to uh, bind and jump. You know, well, what's the scripture where it talks where Jesus, you know, released the 2000 demons, but that that guy. You know, they couldn't keep him chained up. He was he could break yeah. anything they put on him. He was yes. It was like he was on meth or something, but he was full of all these, you know, legion, evil de- yeah. evil spirits. And we absolutely in Christ do have authority over those fallen spirits and even over those and other people. And we're gonna have to really uh realize that um 
the war is on. The war is on. Yeah, I know this could be a whole nother topic because this is a big topic that we're on, and maybe it's getting off the main no, topic. No, it's not a at all, bit. Jimmy. It's not at all because that's uh, the very first scripture we read tonight was the mighty power of Christ given to Exousia. You see, yeah. now we've got this authority. We can choose to use it, you say. All right. So what would be the difference now between that, that we have authority over, and the one we don't? We, we should go to God to re, for the rebuke. Well, and we do have authority over those also in Christ. We do. Um, but it's not the same. It can't be approached from an arrogant, haughty, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm all that in a bag of chips. You right. know, you kiss the ring, devil, like a Lord of the Rings thing. That ain't how it works. It's through his mighty power. And that's why it's in, in Ephesians. That's why it was stressed. Be strong in the Lord and in the power, Kratos, of his yes. might. Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. It talks about how the Kratos is of Christ is over these other powers, which are literally the word exousias. And they're called that because they have the freedom to make choices over our life if we give ourselves uh, in such a position to where they can open the door and let them, let them at us. Yeah. Isn't, isn't authority another definition of exousia? It's one yeah. of the additional— It is sometimes yeah. translated authority. Yeah. yeah. Authority or power. And uh, that's just what it is. When you have authority over someone, you can make decisions on what they can do, can't, and and everything. Uh, in Colossians chapter 2, uh, and I love this, verses 14 and 15, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a shoe of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And he does, he just didn't beat them. He made a shoe of them. He, he made a clown show out of them. He humiliated them. Isn't that when, isn't that when Jesus took back the, the keys from the, from devil, from the devil that, that Adam had given him? It was, was on the, once he died and rose again? Um, it is the time at the cross when he literally, he entered in and it wasn't a battle, you know, no. like a, a lot put in there. He went in and he, by the power of his blood, he totally just vanquished the kingdom of darkness. Mm -hmm. He led captivity captive. And when he did, it was a complete humiliation of the fallen world made a spectacle of them, spoiled them, just made a clown show out of them. Well, just think about it. They they played right into his hands. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's just, I was going to say how stupid, but I don't want to, I don't want to be that arrogant. <laughs> but Mike, you're trying to do all this evil domination and then you do the one thing. I mean, if you said, I mean, the devil saw, all these centuries of sacrifices that was being done, you know, there was a blood sacrifice probably from the beginning of, of the Adam and Eve fall, because that's started with God making them some, some clothes out of an animal that, you know, and then, so, so the devil has seen this for a thousand or 2000 years, whatever. And, and then to just really just make them want to kill Jesus. Wouldn't you think there would be a two and two equals four moment there? Like, hey, wait a minute. Maybe we're doing something God wants us to do. For somebody that has so much intelligence, he could be pretty stupid. And he actually thinks he could win this thing. He do you actually, think he really does? Well. Or is he just so mad that he can't, that he just wants to take as many with him as possible. I've kind of went back and forth on that. Um, he evidently at one time had to have thought he could have won. But I mean... Well, and he convinced a third of the angels that, that he could, yeah, right? Yeah. And when he when the Lord returns, they are going to try to shoot at him with guns. 
<laughs> Could you imagine? You know, well, let's get her body armor on her little helmet and her AR-15, you know? I mean, it, it's it's crazy. But whether he knows or he don't, he had to have at one time known. And I've thought, too, yeah, he's just got to be so mad that he knows what's up. So he's just going to try to take as many people with him as he can. But, um, you know, it is absolutely crazy. And I mean, sin and following Satan is crazy. But almost the whole world is doing it. Right. You know, and uh, that's what we're here for, to tell people you don't have to. You know, you don't have to follow Satan. And, it, you know, these higher entities, it's just like um, they come up and they want to bully you. They give you a little push, you know, give you a push, smack you on head. Come on, come on, come on. And they want to get us to fight them in our own strength. And boy, that doesn't end well. But when we are strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, and we go before the throne and ask the Lord to speak the word and rebuke those dark powers. You see, where do we wrestle? We wrestle in heavenly places. That's where we wrestle at the right hand. We go there and we pour out our heart to the Lord and ask him to speak the word against these dark powers. And he will. And it, it's it's just going to take a lot more prayer in the days we're getting into. It's um, There's just no other way to say it. We're going to have to, like that old Petra song, get on our knees and fight like a man. Remember that one? Oh, yeah. And that's what we're going to that's what we're going to have to do. Now, in Ephesians 2, this is the big difference between us and Job. And there are several texts we could bring forth from the Old Testament that speak of this um, heavenly throne room there. And in Ephesians 2, verse 5 and 6, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together and made us to sit together, here's that phrase again, in heavenly places in Christ. We are seated with him. We have a seat at the table, and we can go before the throne and petition the Lord to rebuke these dark powers. That's the difference between now and and under the old covenant. And in Ephesians 3 and 10, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers, and here it is again, in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Listen to that. Right now unto these powers in heavenly places, the church, the ecclesia, the Israel of God, we make known unto them the mighty wisdom of God by going before the throne and asking Christ to speak the word of his mighty power. That is how these entities are overcome in the higher level. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We wrestle in that it, we wrestle before the throne, and we can only do it by being strong in the power of his might. We can't go in to those realms and want to try to have a fist fight with these entities. It, it won't work. It won't turn out well. And we have to understand that down here, uh, we have authority to, to cast these entities out, and uh, we just let them have it. You know, we just... We just bust them and whack them. And there's also uh, entities that are from the underworld. It it really gets um, – I, I did a big teaching. I don't know how many teachings I did on it, um, on flat earth spiritual warfare. And believe it or not, understanding the true biblical cosmology and the way that entities travel through gates and portals – is a very helpful thing. I, I sure miss your original YouTube channel. I used to go, I, I watched all that stuff and I know a lot of it got lost. I mean, I know you guys still have, have all the copies, but yeah, I remember going, you know, you had a playlist about spiritual warfare. Oh yeah. 
And man, I I listened through that several times. And on our Brideon channel, we have two playlists on spiritual warfare. Okay. One of them I taught before I understood Flat Earth. And it's good. A lot of good stuff in it. But after I understood Flat Earth and how the portals work and the whirlwinds between the gates and, and all of that, I had to reteach it because there was so much more clarity in that comes of the spiritual realm. So I entitled it Flat Earth and Spiritual Warfare. So I remember that. Uh, and that is still, that is on our Brideon channel. And we've got, uh, we don't have it all up, but we've got a lot of those videos uploaded to our Brideon channel. Okay. Um, now, in Ephesians 3 and 20, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Power is so important because our power is woefully insufficient. Now that power there that worketh in us, that's 1411, that is dunamis. That is dunamis. So that is the power that we have. So we have dunamis. We have authority to choose to go to war with the fallen powers. We can we can choose to do that in casting out the the spirits of darkness. We can do that by going before the throne and accessing the mighty power of Christ. And um, it's it's all right there for us. Now, I want to read, read another thing here from Danker's lexicon. And it says this. It says, exousia is used in accordance with knowledge and power. Now, this is a big one. Exousia is used in accordance with knowledge and power. And guess what we find when we run those texts? That exousia is tied to the doctrine of Christ. Now. Let's go back and let's go to the Sermon on the Mount, the final verses. And this is where people are confronted with decisions. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7. And let's begin at about verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. Now, that takes a decision, doesn't it? That takes a decision of your free will. And people have free will. It's amazing to me that so, I mean, we could prove this with so many uh, texts and I could prove it also. I can wiggle my right hand or I can wiggle my left hand. I can touch my nose or I can pull my ear. We can choose to do what we want to do. And when people hear the doctrine of Christ, they can choose to obey or they can choose to ignore it. And the consequences are huge. And it ties in right here at the fundamental level. This determines what power source you're under. Therefore, ever whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house. And it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not. Now that takes a decision, doesn't it? Shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house. And it fell and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astounded at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority, exousia, and not as the scribes. Jesus had authority to bring blessing on those that believed, because when we believe, we put ourselves under his mighty power. And it reminds me just of the book of Job. The book of, In the book of Job, there was the wind came and destroyed his house uh, and his children. 
here it says that if we obey the the commands and the teachings of Christ, that when the storm comes, our house will stand. But it talks about the person that chooses to reject the dark, doctrine of Christ. When those storms come, then that house is going to fall. And there are many more texts that connect the doctrine of Christ, and that's what we're all about here, that we begin by saying the doctrine of Christ is the most important thing in your life. And if you reject the doctrine of Christ, and by that I mean believing that what Jesus taught in Scripture is the absolute authority that we submit to, that it is the way by which we understand all things. That's the way we interpret all of the Word of God is through the doctrine of Christ. Now, if you reject that, you've got a house built on the sand. You have put yourself under the wrong power source. Jesus has all power. You know, uh, it it is just so obvious. And in Mark chapter 1 and verse 27 And they were all amazed as much that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. The authority of Christ was recognized by his doctrine. And this is where we make the decision what power source we are under. The Pharisees rejected the doctrine of Christ, and they stayed under the power empowerment of Satan. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, and let's look at verse 32. And they were astonished at his doctrine For his word was with power, exousia. And when Jesus taught, he could make decisions. He could cast out devils. And to those that would place faith in him, give them new birth, he had real authority. He had real power. And it was connected with his doctrine. And in verse 36, it says, And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power, he commandeth the unclean spirits, and they come out. And literally, and what deliverance is, is just making the decision that uh, understanding we have authority, and we make the decision, and they have to go. And this was connected with the word and the doctrine of Christ over and over again, just like the lexicon says. There's a whole... A section of scripture that connected the power of Christ with the doctrine of Christ. And that's what connects us with the power of God, obeying and believing the doctrine of Christ. It gets us under that right power source. John 15 and 7, we see how this manifests in our prayer life. John chapter 15 and verse 7, and this is right in line with it. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you. That means that you have accepted and believed the doctrine of Christ, that his words are the very word of the Father, that uh, they are truth, and we submit to them. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Amazing. And whenever, you know, the book of James talks about asking amiss. And when we pray from the heart of the Father, which is the doctrine of Christ, we can expect to see miraculous prayers answered to, to advance the kingdom of God. It's, it's right there in the word of God. And this comes down to us. Jesus had authority. And he gives us authority through the Holy Spirit. When we minister the word, it it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verses 4 and 5, Paul said, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit 
and of power. It is the demonstration of power. And Jesus, when he taught, he had power. And when we teach, it will have power if we're teaching the real gospel and teaching the doctrine of Christ. That will change people's lives. And we've seen so many testimonies of that because it isn't us. You know, we can't change your life no more than we can whip a fallen angel, but we can give you the doctrine of Christ that will connect you to the power source. And that's why our teaching is with the demonstration of power, just like the word of God says. Paul put it like this in First Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. And of course, it is according to faith. And in First First Thessalonians chapter 2, And verse 13, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. The words we speak of, we can be wrong about a lot of things. But if we will just teach the word of Christ, most things that Jesus, a lot of things he said were spiritual, but a lot of things were just plain. He taught plain truth to plain people. Um, If Jesus was teaching uh, a hundred people on a hillside, probably 60 or 70 of them couldn't even read or write. He didn't teach in enticing flowery words. It was spiritual. A lot of things, you'll miss it. We talked about eating the flesh and drinking the blood. Well, that's spiritual, you know, and well, um, you know, how can I enter again and uh, to my mother's womb? Well, you got to think spiritual about that new birth and about eating and drinking the flesh of Christ. And it's it's a it's a power that it works in people. I mean, it will work in you and it will change you when you receive the word as it is. It's not just our words. You know, we're uh, you know, we can mess up boy, and we do, but we're packing a message that's got power. It'll put you under the right power source. It will give you power to get in the fight. You see, and here again, we think of that text that the Holy Spirit is given to them that obey him. You don't need a gun if you're not going to fight, you know, and you don't need gas in your car if you're not going to go anywhere. We need to get in the fight. We are in a fight whether we know it or not, and we just have to make the decision that, well, we do have authority. We can make a difference, and we Jesus was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. We're going to read that text in just a moment. And in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 11, I love this text. We have to keep this in mind. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return and do me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I send it. It's not about us, but if Jimmy and I, and this is our heart's intent, if we can just put out the doctrine of Christ, boy, that's going to accomplish things. And it has accomplished so much in people's lives, so many marvelous testimonies. And it's just that. It's the message. It's the message. It's got authority. It'll hook you up with the right power source. It'll effectually work and you that believe it'll change you. And it's not just some kind of an intellectual um, mind trip, but it's connecting up with the power source of Christ. And it's it's just an awesome and a powerful thing. And that's why when uh, we just keep plugging, we just keep putting out the word of God and the results and the testimonies, they come in because it's his word, it's his power. It kind of reminds me of when uh, John Wesley and George Whitfield, <laughs> you know, when I was a kid, I had a cigarette club. Back when I was riding my bicycle, we would take, uh, would get cigarettes and would put them in a baggie and would hide them in a ditch uh, at the edge of town, would sneak down there and would get her cigarettes out, have a cigarette club. We was little rascals when he was doing that. But John Wesley, he did a little better than that. He had a holiness club there when he was at, uh, at Oxford and he had 
him and his brother Charles and George Whitefield. And they got together and they would pray every day for extended periods of time. And John Wesley said, if the Lord will just give me 10 men that will totally sell out to God, I'll change England. And there was a book written, Europe, before and after John Wesley. You know, just think of that. Europe before it, and America also, the uh, Methodist circuit riders that came over with Francis Asbury and so many I can mention, it had so much to do with America's godly beginning. It didn't come from the founding fathers, but it come from the Puritans and the Methodist circuit riders that preached the gospel. It, it was just amazing. And uh, I could just go on and on about that. But when they came to the coal fields, they had been Whitfield and Wesley had been banned from every pulpit in England. And so they went to the coal mines and they would preach to the miners when the shift would change. And they would preach there and preach there. It was like nothing happened. And man, they were praying about ready to give up. And they were preaching one day and it said they said that they the miner's face was covered in soot. And he saw the tears start breaking the soot and making a break in that soot down the face. And revival broke out among the coal miners, and they started coming to Christ. And uh, a great revival broke out. And the word is powerful. The word is powerful. And we have to always remember that it's not about us. It's about him. It's his mighty power, whether we're giving the gospel to bring conversion in a soul, or whether we're fighting before the throne. It's about his mighty power. It ain't about us. We really have to keep that in mind. In Jeremiah 23, beginning in verse 28, the prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the shaft to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. The word of God is like a hammer, you know, and it, it says, you know, if you've got a dream, if you've got a real word from God, and a real message from him, and oh boy, we've got one, speak it. There's so much lies out there. There's so many uh, false visions, so much shaft, but God's word's like a hammer. It'll break through all of it. It'll break through 24 hours of TVN, and it'll break through, and it'll give you the truth, and it'll convert you, and it'll hook you up to something real. It'll hook you up to something real, and it will be meaningful in your life. And what the Great Commission is all about, and let's read that in Matthew chapter 28. The Great Commission is simple. We preach the gospel, and we have to get the right one. And sadly today, the word repent has been taken out of most gospel presentations. You don't hear it very much. Matthew chapter 28. And we'll begin with 18, Matthew 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All exousia. There are other powers, some pretty strong ones in the earthly realm and also in the spiritual. But Jesus has all power. He has the ability to make decisions about everything and everybody. Nobody is higher over him in the pecking order. All power. Go ye therefore. And the reason why we go, go ye therefore, because he has all power, go ye therefore. We have to understand that we're going on the commission of the one that has all power. And go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe 
all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Now, this is what we do week in and week out. We teach the things that Jesus taught and commanded. And until you're teaching the doctrine of Christ, there is no other doctrine. There's one faith, one Lord, one baptism. And the only faith there is, is the faith of Christ and his doctrine. That's it. There is no other. Um, All things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That's that's our commission, and that's what we do. We, We go from the one that has all power, and we bring people underneath the power of that one that has all power. And we have to understand that, you know, like Jesus said in that one text, you know, don't think I'm come to bring peace on the earth. I come to bring a sword. Yeah. Come to bring a sword. And in First John chapter 3 and verse 8, he that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. There's a fight. Jesus is out to destroy the works of the devil. When Jesus taught, he had authority. He cast out devils. He would pray and people would be healed. He said, you go. He'll give us authority. And when we are under the proper power source, we can expect the same results. But we got to exousia is a choice. We have to choose to get in the fight. We have to realize the power we have and that whatever station in life or wherever we are, we can use that power to advance the kingdom of God against the kingdom of darkness. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, and let's look at verse 19, Luke chapter 10 and verse 19. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. We have authority. We can stomp them. And here's again these first level powers. And in Revelation 9, when the abyss will be opened, it talks about these entities coming out that look like scorpions. And I'll just say a bit about the forces from the underworld. And we are getting calls on a very frequent basis about people that are seeing shadow people. You know, they're seeing little shadowy figures. I mean, it's rampant. And uh, a lot of people are seeing these things. And literally, I believe that these are the spirits that come from the underworld. This is the way it's described. You know, the Bible talks about the witch of Endor. Well, no, it doesn't. Doesn't The witch of Endor isn't in the Bible. It's the, the woman with the familiar spirit, Endor. The words in the Hebrew are the Av. She was an Av. There's the Av. And you see familiar spirit and wizard together. It's the Av and the Adonai and the Hebrew. And these are the people that have the occult art of bringing up spirits from the underworld. And this, when people are having problems with these type of things, this is the advice that we give. And we gave this out again just this week repeatedly because it's very, very common is that you check your house for an ungodly object that can be like a devil magnet, uh, whether it's a, a pagan statue, masks, these type of things. Uh, I remember one time there was a young married couple that had only been married about a month and they were having crazy stuff going in their house. So we did a little walkthrough and there above their bed were, uh, there was a death mask and there were two whips like this. And it wasn't that they were into crazy stuff. They just thought that was cool to put up there. And these come from Africa and got those things, destroyed them. And their problem was solved. Hmm. Also, in the Torah, it talks about blood defiling the land. When there's been blood shed on the land, it will defile it. And you can pray 
on the basis of the cross for the cleansing of your land, uh, for the any shed blood that was there. And also, uh, we will anoint the the doors, the windows, and uh, anoint everything and just take authority, you know, drive them first heaven spirits out of there, drive them spirits of the one underward there. There it says, you know, you can stomp on them serpents and scorpions. You can stomp them, just romp them and stomp them, take authority, seal your house up. And uh, this is how we do the battle with them. But we, we got to get in the fight. If you just let them push you around, it's just like a bully. They'll just make your life miserable. But we have authority and we can take authority and we can push back on those. Hmm. A text from the prophet Isaiah. And this is such a blessed scripture. Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 17. And I believe that we'll close with this. It says, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. With all-